Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com. Um, so I'm here to do today a couple more updates, but uh, mainly I want to talk about um, some stuff from television. So the TV series uh, known as Sense8, I've, I've basically binged over the last three weeks. It's like December 4th or something like that. Um, I'm meaning to watch that in the expanse the sci-fi show um that a lot of people have raved about for many years and i've kind of slept on both of them so the short shortest possible story about sense eight though i don't remember i think i heard about it in like 2017 i don't think i heard about it right when it came out which is kind of sad because i had access to netflix at least as early as 2016 i think it was before that I can't remember. The first thing I remember watching on Netflix was Stranger Things, but I watched some other stuff, I think, before that, but just, I'd have to jog my memory. But the first season of Sensei was on Netflix in 2015, the summer, like June, May or June of 2015. In fact, I have it pulled up just so I could look that up. Um, yeah, June of, June of 15, the whole, the first season was uploaded. So, Sensei... S-E-N-S-E, -E, and the number eight. <sighs> Created by the Wolkowski sisters and J. Michael Straczynski. I'm wearing my Babylon 5 t-shirt. J. Michael Straczynski, the creator of Babylon 5. And he's gone on to do other things I like. Particularly Jeremiah, the Luke Perry, um, Malcolm Jamal Warner. Kind of um, somewhat post-apocalyptic show that was short-lived only for for two seasons. I love both of those shows. I, mean, I love Babylon. Also, he did Crusade, too, which was a spin-off of Babylon 5, but I've always had a high amount of respect for J. Michael Straczynski. Um, and he's done some other stuff. He did a movie called Changeling. He's done some other television. I can't remember which shows. But um, when I read that he was involved in this, I was like, I really should look into this, because I follow him on Twitter and everything, and, and one of my friends posted about Sensei. So, I, I think it was... I don't remember it was 2018. I think it was 2018 when they they only did two seasons since eight, and then they did a special two and a half hour series finale episode movie, you want to call it. Um, but I think it was like just after that, I it got me motivated to check it out, and I checked out the first two episodes. And then I was in the middle of watching some other stuff. I, I think that was, it might have been the tw summer of 2018 when I was, I'd watched Westworld, the first two seasons of Westworld, and a couple other things. But around that same time, I also was watching, like I finally, I slept on, because I'm a fan of the Wachowskis, particularly the first Matrix movie. Of course, the Matrix Revolutions just came out. Revolutions? Yeah. Resurrections? Revolution? Really? Re Resur the, the Resurrection, the fourth movie just came out on um, HBO Max, which I haven't watched, but when I knew that was coming out, the fourth Matrix movie, I had the intention of trying to watch Sense8 also, so it kind of gave me double motivation uh, between JMS and, um, you know, the new Matrix movie with the Wachowskis. Um, and, but around 2017 and 2018, I was watching a lot of sci-fi with technology and robots and androids and that per se. I mean, I, I watched Battlestar Galactic. I was a Battlestar Galactic fan. Terminator movies. But um, I'd never seen Blade Runner, and I'd never seen Westworld, the movie, or the TV series. So I got into those movies. And so then I also, since I'm a fan of the Wachowskis, I wanted to see some of their other stuff. I never watched uh, Speed Racer, which maybe I still could. But I did check out Cloud Atlas and also Jupiter, uh, Jupiter Ascending, I think it was called. Um, Cloud Atlas I liked. The problem with Cloud Atlas was it was such a long movie. I wasn't, I was, you know, the reviews were mixed, even though I liked Tom Hanks and uh, Halle Berry. I slept on it and just find I would watch it in segments. So I watched it over a couple days, finally, around that time, 2017. And I, I liked it. I mean, it was, it's a long, epic story about the different people, the same, those two people mainly, but other people through different periods of time. Um, anyway, so the Wachowskis, the Wachowski sisters, did this Sense8 project, and again, I watched those first two episodes, and I was only lukewarm about it, but I, I just kind of felt like I, I probably should invest more time, but I was busy watching other things. 
Um, so I just never got around to it, but I was in the back of my mind, I'd watch other shows, you know, between Cobra Kai even recently and, um, I don't know, the stuff the last couple of years, you know, Better Call Saul, you know, the other TV shows I've liked. So I just decided I got to sit down and really invest in it. And then I started watching more of it. I watched that and The Expanse, which I'm on the second season. And I was just, I was enjoying Sense8 more. I said, I'm just going to just sit down and finish this. So I, I did binge it. And it's, I mean, it's a story. Well, we're like 10 minutes into this video. It's a story about, in effect, eight people that discover their psychically, telepathically, emotionally, spiritually, uh, mentally connected, and they're all in different parts of the globe. It's not it ranging from literally every place on the globe, I mean, but a pretty, pretty good diverse range from, there's a, a guy, a gay actor man from Mexico, uh, a woman from Iceland, um, uh, a woman from Korea, um, a, woman, a guy from Germany, and then a guy from Chicago, and a, a trans woman from San Francisco, um, and then a uh, a guy from, a man from, um, he's from Kenya, Nairobi, I think it is. Um, I should know the trivia. Anyway, I think that's it. I think those are the eight. Oh, and then there's a woman from East India, too. So, pretty good distance spanning, time zone, cultural span, and different, like, different cultural um, aspects to their all connect in different ways. And this whole thing, they discover they, they're known as the sensei, they're a different kind of human, um, and they can sort of be in each other's place. They can go and call on each other once they get to know. They're, they, they're known as a cluster, you learn about. Um, anyway, um, I mean, you'd have to watch the show. I don't want to explain every single detail about the show. It really just makes sense to try watching it. But I would say that if you watch the first couple episodes on Netflix... You might not necessarily know the entire scope of what happens. Um, so, in, in other words, give it a little more time. Some people just blow off shows after one or two episodes, which I've, I'm guilty of that myself, I think, sometimes. So, that's my thing, and so I, I stuck with it, and it was well worth the payoff, in fact. Um, you know, it was an expensive show to make, I would guess, given that they were shooting on location with all these cast members and all their support uh, cast members. In terms of the name recognition faces, Naveen Andrews from Lost is in it. Daryl Hannah, who's, you know, known from many movies between Roxanne and Splash and you name it. Um, uh, those are probably the two biggest names. You have Sylvester McCoy making some, some guest appearances from Doctor Who, and you, and you have Freema Agamon, who was uh, Martha on Doctor Who, so I knew her. The rest of the cast... I mean, some of the support people I kind of recognize at points, but I didn't really know too many of them. As it turned out, I think four of them, Freema, Max something, the gentleman who plays Wolfgang, um, and then Brian J. Smith, who plays Will Gorski, all showed up. Those three at least showed up in um, Rax Remelt in the new Matrix movie. So, um, Terrence Mann, which he's like the biggest... He's more or less the antagonist and the villain in the show. He plays sort of a controlling sensei of sorts. That's just vague about his description. I've seen him in some other stuff, but I can't remember. And of course, my internet upstairs here doesn't work right now, so I can't really... I could try loading it in, but I don't think it will work. Nope. Um, I know him. I can't remember if he was known for some stuff on, like, Showtime. and I can't remember. I, I'll probably remember it later. Anyway, so... Um, you know, it's a really fulfilling show. It's very epic, very, a lot of action, romance, a lot of sexual and nudity, sexual situations and nudity in it, almost over the top. But I think it's bold and it was very, um, bold and, um, uh, ambitious to do that. And I think it's very, a very unique show and probably will stand the test of time and probably over time will probably be one that people want to go back to. As much as it's only a short-lived series, it only was 24 episodes. I will say, though, the first two seasons, the second season, they recast the, um, the gentleman who played from, from Nairobi. Um, what's his name? He's known as Van Dam, not j -Lop. He's known as Van Dam, and I, should, I have the cast right here, and I'm not seeing him for some reason. Anyways, they recast him, and 
while I like the guy that replaced him, I like the guy that the the actor that was in the first season a little more. Um, what was his? His real name is Sephi. His character's name is Sephius. I forget the actor's name. And I, again, I don't have that because it's not on here. Um, it was, it, I guess, it was a conflict of interest, conflict of creative differences on his character in the second season. I guess they shot some scenes with him with the the, the gentleman who played Cepheus or, or Van Damme in the first season. He, but you know, then he left the set, and so they recast the the guy was good who played the the second season version, but it was sort of. It's a little weird. It was like, you know, Dumbledore being recast by as Michael, Michael Gabon versus, you know, uh, Richard Harris just was so good as Dumbledore. But um, it was a mi minor quibble. The, the se series finale, though, I mean, it's a series finale, so I'm not really spoiling a lot. But there's a few plot lines, including Cepheus' plot line, that was kind of just not really resolved. And some of the stuff sort of got brushed over. Um, Sun's character, the the woman from Korea, her circumstance with her brother really wasn't resolved. They did that whole build-up episode about her going up against her brother. Her brother's, and you know, the things I read something about his brother was working for this BPO organization, and, and I don't remember actually any detail explaining that. Like, I read something online about that, and I didn't see it. I mean, I... I've watched some reviews. I probably haven't watched all the reviews and some interviews, but um, kind of a minor quibble. But I mean, you're all invested in your life, and then some of them just jump ship, and then they end up meeting for this whole situation to try to go after the you know the main villain, Whispers, um, in Paris. Um, so yeah, there were there were some hangups, you know, and some of it was a little contrived, and some of it, you know, where they're there and they're not there, they're there, they're able to do all this stuff. I mean. Yeah, you got to kind of think a little bit outside the box about, you know, it's science fiction, it's fiction. You know, I mean, it's you want to believe there's some sense of reality of what this could this could happen, psychic, you know, telepath telepathic connections, but um it didn't it, to me it didn't really hurt because you care for the characters, you're won over by them. Uh, it's an interesting take, a very diverse cast, a diverse it brings up a lot of you know, social, political issues that, you know, and it's, again, it was very kind of forward thinking in what it did. A lot of TV shows haven't done this kind of stuff. And the fact, you know, again, I'm biased. I'm a, I'm a ba Babylon 5 and J. Michael Zinsky fan, and I'm a, a Matrix fan to an extent. And so I, I, I guess if you're not a fan of either of those, maybe you would be a le less inclined to really get much into this. It's very LGBTQ focused, um, you know, it's just very liberal-minded, I guess. And so, you know, if your politics and your kind of mentality about some of this stuff, you know, you can't really drop that while you're watching something, you may not go for it as much. And, you know, I know I had some mixed reviews, but overall it's positive. And, I, again, I think it's probably done, it's, it's probably reached a lot of people since it ended. I know it had a lot of passionate cult-following fans that I think that the last episode, that two-and-a-half-hour episode they did in 2018, the was really driven by the fans saving it, basically. Because um, it was, you know, this the, the, the season two finale doesn't really wrap anything up. I mean, it just says they're about to go to war with the, with the BPO organization and Whispers. So, but that's pretty much what, I mean, that's, and I'm not trying to spoil too much, but that's, you know, you really, the, you really need the, the series finale as much as they, they probably needed a third season, in truth. And they, they intended to, but, you know, they had to settle and compromise for the two-and-a-half-hour finale. I don't know. They could potentially bring it back. The, the ending of the, of the two-and-a-half-hour finale, though, I mean, they could do some things, but they didn't really tease or bring anything up to, like, kind of open up potential. I don't know. I think they could have done more with the, the some of the other clusters, some of the other sensates. That's one thing they could do. They could potentially could do it... I don't know, they, they could do a prequel, obviously, at some point. I don't know, from a cost standpoint and from a sort of time standpoint, that would have to be part of it, you know. It did well enough, obviously, for for Netflix to, you know, be able to provide for it. It didn't get dropped right away, but, um, you know, and then the other thing is obviously the cast. You know, are they going to end up um, casting... Um, are they, are they, would they be able to get the whole cast back if they did do you know, something falling up eventually, or, I don't know, but, um, if not, you know, again, it's one of those shows that I, I feel bad I slept on, I wish I would have 
watched in real time and been able to have the shared experience to experience it while others were, were doing that, but you know, better late than never. So now I'm going to try to focus on The Expanse, which I'm only on the second season, I've only watched the first three episodes, and there's there's like 40 some odd episodes, so it's going to be a little bit more of an epic journey. The f final season is going on, it's got like two more episodes left. So I don't think I'm going to be watching that in real time either, but my goal is at least sometime maybe by maybe by March to have, be, have caught up and finally, finally finished The Expanse and then I can make a video about that. But I was going to mention that, um, yeah, I've been sort of investigating some new music of, recent, of late too, just off the top of my head I can mention. Um, this band, um, they're called Black Country New Road. Them, they're part of that whole post-punk, art-punk scene that like Squid is from the UK. And then, as a Pepe Deluxe fan, just today I'm listening to this guy named Bruno Panadas. Bruno, what is it? Bruno, Bruno Pernadas, and the Private Reasons record from 2021. That's what I'm listening to. But um, as a Pepe Deluxe fan, there's those Pepe Deluxe fans on, or Bruno, Bruno Pernadas fans on RateYourMusic.com on the Pepe Deluxe page and talk about it. Bruno Pernata's fans should love Pepe Deluxe and vice versa, so. Um, there's a couple others that I'm, I'm also checking out, so. Yeah, it's, it's, um, but I'm also, you know, we're going to 2018, the playlists are on the way, because the 2018 albums of the year list I've been making on the on Dream Theater forums are, are almost done, because I just did 2018, so just, we have a couple more left. Um, so at that point, then I'm going to start to try to create playlists, and then I'll try to share them on I might try using my blog again with that too but I'll put them on social media and then also with um with uh with with you know on on YouTube and everything um I also notice a I have a fan of the band um well of course being the fan of the Deer Hunter there's this guy gentleman named Josh Ralt who was a touring member of the Deer Hunter at one point he's got this project I had two albums called Mercies the band was called Mercies from the early to mid 2010s um, kind of jangly power pop he has a really nice smooth voice well he has a new project um, out now I can't even remember the name of it <laughs> um, but I noticed that the other day and so there's some stuff a lot of stuff coming out for 2022 and including that band that he has the Josh Reltz band I, I wish I could remember the top of my head I can't remember the top right now but um, I actually wait a minute do I have this pulled up no I don't but, um, yeah, that's, I'll have to be making some of those videos soon, hopefully, you know, 2022, a lot of stuff we're hoping will be happening. Um, what was the name of it? Just, I, I stumbled across it the other day. Actually, I know how to find out. If I look up history, Shell Pink is the name of the project that he's put, Josh Rawls project, um, from Mercy's. I don't know if Mer Mercy's put out a video on YouTube. I noticed that it was a video from, from song. The song Aaliyah or something like that from their last record in 2015, but he's he's put out like four or five songs, a couple on on the sound they're on sound SoundCloud page for that, but um you know the Deer Hunter fans should know at least have some memories of Mercies, so you know the Shell Pink project it's it's you know good stuff. I don't know how much I'd say it differs from Mercies a little bit, but you know maybe it's more a kind of a dream. Dream kind of ambient post rock. Is there a thing called post pop? <laughs> post rock pop, you know, poppy post rock. I don't know. It's kind of in that vein. I don't know. I guess I've listened to the songs a couple of times. Um, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that because I'm a fan of Mercy's and Josh Ralt. So um, anyway, but uh, it's a lot to t talk about. But what's your t if I do watch The Matrix uh, Resurrection, I'll have to do a review. The reviews have not been incredibly favorable. I'm glad I invested time into Sense8 instead of that. But uh, what's your take on Sense8? Um, and, and for that matter, you know, any of the stuff that the Wakalsis or JMS have done. Uh, are you looking forward to the Babylon 5 reboot also, of course? So I'm wondering if some of the people that were involved with Sense8 could be showing up in that, just like some of them just did show up in the Matrix uh, Resurrection movie. But thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.